Hi everyone, Stepan here. I'm going to show you my round one game from the Barcelona Suns Open uh, I played about two weeks ago. Uh, okay, so there's a long story connected to this tournament and to this game and I will be telling it on Patreon in chapters. I actually gave an intro yesterday, so if you would like to hear all the details, the, the videos are available there. But long story short, uh, when I came to Barcelona after two days of traveling, uh, uh, when I got to my accommodation, I had to leave because it was just dreadful. I just couldn't stay there. It was, it smelled bad, my bed, had hair all over it the linen wasn't clean and i just there was no way i i could stay there i would rather walk home than stay there so about 15 minutes after i would entered the apartment i rented through airbnb i just left and i had no money for other accommodation so i had to think of what to do in in any case it wasn't easy I ended up sorry walking through barcelona until 1 a.m the day before round one and i actually remember walking past the tournament hall and seeing the pairings and i saw that i was paired against a three-time italian champion grandmaster david alberto whom i've actually heard of and i know some of his games and my head just wasn't in in chess at that point because i had nowhere to sleep so I had to figure things out day by day. Uh, okay, uh, that, that's the, the short story. So when I finally managed to get a room that day, a room that I could pay for, I started preparing around one o'clock in the morning after trying to get a refund through Airbnb, which I, in the end, didn't manage to get. Uh, now, David Alberto plays a lot of things. He is an extremely strong player. Uh, he defeated Leon Levaich easily with the white pieces, who is one of the most promising Croatian players. Uh, he recently drew Alexei Shirov and many other 26, 2700 players and also beat them. So he is a strong grandmaster. Okay, so I had the black pieces. Uh, he started pawn e4. Uh, now, I wasn't really sure what he was going to play, but there were options. Uh, and, of course, I played the Karakan. So he went for the two knights, which I would sort of expected. It's a part of his repertoire. So d5, knight f3, bishop g4. And he played h3, of course, and... For a while, uh, during my preparation, I was thinking of going bishop h5. But the tactical implications of bishop h5 uh, and the dangers are huge for black. And one mistake could mean it's game over. So in the end, I decided to just take an e6. He played bishop e2, which is a very rare move, uh, in my opinion. Uh, now, the setup is yet to be revealed, of course, but usually bishop e2 comes in combination with d4. That's the setup uh, that I'm aware of. After knight f6, though, he played d3. Now I'm used to, instead of d3 castles, knight bd7, d4, and that sort of standard. But d3, I, I just didn't know. I don't know this position, or I didn't know it at the time. And I wasn't really sure what to do. It doesn't seem... Uh, very ambitious, let's put it that way. And I'm not really sure where the queen is going to go, although I did find out a move later. So I played knight bd7 and he played queen g3. Now I had three candidate moves uh, in this position. And by the way, I was playing on board 11, it was all uh, live, it was a live board, uh, and the first, I don't know, 15 boards or something like that are in a uh, separate area and it was really fancy, not something I'm used to. Uh, so, yeah, I was thinking of going g6, queen b6 or e5. Uh, if I do go queen b6, then he probably just castles and then I have to go g6 anyway. So I might as well go g6 without queen b6 because... This doesn't really do much uh, 
Of course, it prevents bishop e3, but that's not such a big deal. So I quickly discarded queen b6. g6 was more interesting, in my opinion. Uh, so after castles, I can just go bishop g7. And since I got rid of my light squared bishop, this is perfectly fine. All of my pawns are on light squares. Uh, these dark squares really aren't that weak unless he manages to trade off the bishop. I should also mention that e5 isn't something I should worry about because of knight g8 and then I have the f5 square. Also, I can go c5 and knight c6 and that's, again, extremely pleasant. e5 would actually be a mistake in this position and I'm sure he wouldn't have played it. But I sort of remember the setup from a while back in my preparation, which I decided to go for, and it's a bad setup. After my next move, I'm much worse. I did play e5. And the way to punish e5 straight away, which he luckily did not see, is ed, cd, and bishop f3. And I saw all of this, and I thought it just doesn't work because of rook c8. Uh, threatening the c2 pawn and threatening queen a5 check, so you cannot just take twice unless you want to give up your bishop pair. Uh, also, if you do give up your bishop pair and take with the knight, then after knight c3, uh, I could just take, because on bishop d2, I could go bishop b4. So that's what I was thinking about. a3 doesn't really threaten anything because uh, the rooks are still disconnected. So this was sort of my calculation. I just thought that on rook c8 he couldn't take, which is true, he shouldn't take, but there are better moves and if he just castles, uh, I'm, I'm much worse because it's not easy to defend the pawn. Okay, so he just castled, which is also fine. <clears throat> and I played queen c7 and in this position the engine gives this as more than plus 2 for white, which just means that I'd completely misunderstood the position and that e5 is, is a blunder, which is true. So now e takes, and I cannot really take with the c pawn because of knight b5, uh, so knight takes, and this is what I'd intended actually before playing e5. I spent a lot of time on e5. So knight takes, c takes, and here he played d4. And all of this I saw. So pinning the pawn to my queen, and I was thinking of castling queenside, so I, so I did, okay? And I thought, okay, this is a double-edged position, but it seems fine to me. I'm not sure how white maintains the center. c4 isn't that easy to play, I always have king b8, my queen is now defended. Uh, it turns out that a very simple move like bishop e3 would have kept his huge advantage. And I have to go king b8, or my a pawn is hanging, and now c4. And even though white has no center anymore, uh, my queen is sort of out there, M my structure doesn't exist, and his bishop pair is going to be extremely strong. So <clears throat> this would have been very hard to defend. Instead, he played queen f3, and after the game, when we were analyzing analyzing, we were discussing the game without the board. Uh, we both agreed that he had to be much better here. Uh, and he said, I think my queen f3 was a bit too ambitious. I mean, saying I agree would sound arrogant. Uh, I had no idea whether queen f3 was the best move or not at, at the time. <clears throat> but it turned out to be uh, not too ambitious, but uh, too passive actually because it the threat it creates is easy to deal with and white has just lost a ton of time on queen f3 so queen f3 turned out to be a mistake uh, I only have one move here I have to take on d4 uh, and he can choose he can take on, on d5 or take on f7 taking on d5 really should not be promising because of uh, because of knight f6 followed by a bishop uh, to d6 and all of a sudden black is better. So he took on f7 and 
I've, I'd briefly entertained the possibility of going knight e5, but it's not a good move. Uh, so just knight f6. And in this position, the material is equal. I have double d pawns, but they're actually extremely useful when it, when it comes to dampening the power of his bishop pair. I don't know if you can see the move times, by the way. Uh, I've imported this from the tournament uh, website. So at this point, I had 40 minutes on the clock. He had an hour and five. Uh, he has a choice. He can play queen c7 or he can play queen e6. Uh, he did play queen c7, but on queen e6, if I, I, now I have a choice, queen d7 or king b8, I would have played king b8. And I have to say, and this is embarrassing, when we were discussing the game, I'd suggested queen e6, king b8, c4, uh, trying to open up the position, but this just fails to rook e8, losing the bishop. It's really bad to suggest such a blunder to a grandmaster. At the time, he said, okay, I didn't consider that. Uh, I hope he forgot about my suggestion. But yeah, on... on uh, on king b8 he cannot go c4 straight away, so I'm gonna have time to develop and he can probably start with bishop d3. Uh, but yeah, instead he just took on c7, king c7 and rook d1, okay, bishop c5, I have to defend my pawn, bishop f4 check, king c6. And here white should be better, but he actually went for a plan that's not quick enough he played a3 he wanted to gain space chase my bishop away and weaken the c5 pawn uh, i think he should have gone for bishop d3 this is actually was i what i was afraid of the most just not doing anything about my dark squared bishop saying that it's a bad piece against this i probably would have gone knight e4 uh, of course if this knight is ever taken my position is amazing because I have these two pawns in the center and he no longer has the bishop pair and I can look forward to d3 creating a passed pawn that's supported by the rook on d8. So he probably chases my knight away because otherwise my knight is too annoying and uh, now I was thinking bishop d6 and I thought my position was okay here. So bishop d6, knight d6, rook e1 and I wasn't sure what to do here. Uh, I was going to play rook to d7 actually, which may be a bad move, uh, simply because allowing uh, rook e, if I play rook e8, then rook e8, rook e8, bishop h7, uh, rook e2 can be met with bishop d3, defending the c2 pawn and chasing my rook away. So it turns out this position is just better for white, I'd completely underestimated it. He did play a3 though. And now the engine says equal, equal, equal. Uh, I didn't feel like it was equal. I thought he was still better, but I liked my pawns in the center. And this is a great example of how doubled pawns can be very useful. Uh, of course, you're, you're playing a 2500 Grandmaster, so he's going to be able to exploit every single weakness you create. But considering that he has a, a bishop pair that isn't really doing that much, except on this side of the board, because of the pawns, they turned out to be a strength uh, more so than a weakness. I played rook hg8. Uh, this isn't precise. I should have played rook hf8, uh, but I wasn't sure what that accomplishes. Uh, I'd looked at it, of course, but I liked gaining a tempo on the bishop. Bishop f1. Now, he could have played uh, bishop d3, that would have been more precise. And now there's a team in this position that's very annoying for white, and that's playing d3 when the knight is on e4, threatening to take on f2, now that he has removed the blockade. But I couldn't, I, I just couldn't make it work. After knight e4, b4 is what I was afraid of, bishop b6 and a4. And if I go d3, I wasn't actually afraid of a5, I was afraid of b5 where after king d7, he can just take on d3, threatening to take on d5 with check, and after something like bishop f2, king h2, I had no idea how to defend this position. 
it seemed like trading his f pawn for my one of my d pawns isn't a good idea. So instead, I played rook e4, which isn't good. Uh, he just played bishop d2, and I thought he has to play bishop d2, and that's true because otherwise I just go h6 and chase the bishop and win the bishop, and the bishop ends or the bishop ends up on d2 anyway. Of course, he doesn't want to go bishop c1. Uh, disconnecting his rooks and my idea was after this I'm gonna go a6 okay giving my bishop a square so b4 bishop a7 which is a mistake I should have played bishop d6 which I didn't even consider I wanted to keep my bishop on this diagonal and I thought b5 wasn't possible uh, now b5 isn't a bad move uh, but it's f it's not ideal either after b5 I take, he plays rook a b1, and now bishop c5, threatening to take the a3 pawn, and it seems like he's getting a lot of play and cornering my king, but I'm actually not only going to survive this, but I'm going to end up in a comfortable position once he delivers all of these checks. So bishop b5 check, king d6 only move. I, I could actually go king c7 as well, but okay uh bishop d3 rook e7 and bishop f4 check okay and now after king c6 uh it's not really clear how he should proceed if he plays bishop b5 check king b6 something like bishop d3 king c6 there is no progress to be made i'm still threatening to take the a pawn I'm controlling the e-file, I can double my rooks at some point, I still have knight e4, if the bishop moves I still have d3. My ultimate goal strategically was to put a knight on c6, on c3, sorry, and do that to just control the b-file, chasing his rook away. Uh, so bishop b5 wasn't really a big deal. Instead he played a4, which doesn't increase the threat because bishop b5 is still met with king b6 so i just played knight e4 <clears throat> uh, he played rook e1 pinning uh, my knight and the rook is defended though so knight c3 and this is a trade uh, he's gonna take on h7 i'm gonna take on a4 and before playing knight c3, uh, at this point I should mention I had 14 minutes, he had 29 before his next move. So he was slightly ahead on the clock, but and there were still 11 moves to go before the time control. So time trouble seemed sort of inevitable, at least for me. 14 minutes for 11 moves against the Grandmaster isn't ideal. So he took on e7, bishop takes, rook e1. And bishop d6 and here he sort of allowed me to to get away with it i think he could have created a lot more pressure with rook e6 than with his move uh of course i have to go king c7 if king d7 bishop f5 uh, and now rook e7 check rook d7 bishop d6 king d6 rook d7 king d7 bishop h7 knight a4 this seems a lot more promising than what happened in the game. Uh, I think there's a possibility for white to win this. Even though I have a very strong pass pawn on the d file as soon as I play b5, b4, b3. However, uh, these three pawns are also very strong and my knight is on a4. So even though the engine says that should be a draw, I'm not sure I would have drawn this endgame. In fact, I'm pretty sure I wouldn't have. Still, my idea would have been to bring the knight to c5, eventually liquidate the b-pawn and try to create counterplay with my d-pawn, or vice versa. Instead, he played bishop g5. And now I played rook f8. I want to prevent bishop f5. Uh, I was afraid of... Uh, I was afraid of rook e6 and bishop e7, uh, followed by bishop f5. So in this way, I actually have rook f rook f7, and I'm preventing bishop f5. So he just made the trade. So bishop h7, knight a4. 
And knight a4 actually significantly helps me, not because I took the pawn, but because I get to play knight c5. And knight c5 is the ideal square for my knight, because from c5 I can transfer back to c3. I'm preventing rook e6. And I'm controlling b3 and d3, making b5, b4, b3 much easier to play. And if I trade off the b-pawn, I don't think I can lose, uh, simply because there isn't enough material on the board. If all the pawns are on one side, uh, the bishop pair isn't really any more powerful than my knight and bishop combined, especially if my knight is sitting on e4 or on c5. Uh, he played rook e8 here. Uh, it's hard to suggest a move at this point. Uh, there isn't really a clear way for him to make progress. Uh, if he does not play rook e8, I would have just gone b5. Uh, so yeah, we, we traded. Bishop takes, king c7. He played bishop g6. And I immediately started liquidating the pawns. So b5. If there are no pawns on the board, I cannot lose. Also, if I play d3 and my pawn is already on b4, I could queen my pawn. So to be honest, at this point I had no idea who was better and why. Uh, the good news is I still had 11 minutes on the clock with 4 moves to make before time control. So I played relatively quickly. Uh, he played king f1, I played king d7, uh, he played bishop f5 check and I played king c6. If he doesn't want to allow me to this side of the board, then I'm just going to move up. My idea was b4, king b5, uh, king c4. Okay, king e2, b4, h4, uh, and now knight e4. And of course, if I, if I take this bishop, then it's just an automatic draw, there is no way for either of us to win. Uh, equal material in an opposite colored bishop endgame with doubled pawns on the g-file and on the d-file. So he, he of course declines the trade. King c5. Uh, the bishop came to g6, although I'm not sure why. I think he may have wanted to go uh, to a4 at some point to prevent b3. Okay, king c4 f3 chases the knight away but the knight just goes back to c5 and again if he checks me i don't think that's a big deal uh, because then i have a passed b pawn and my my bishop is actually just as strong as his so he played g4 i played b3 now this does not have to be taken but if it isn't taken if he just i don't know continues with with h5 then takes and if bishop takes, I have a d3 check. So he probably should take, so he took. Now I can take with the king or with the knight. I wasn't sure which was better, but I liked taking with the king because it brings my king one square closer and sort of restricts his bishop and keeps my knight in control of all the squares. And also, if his bishop moves, I could continue king c2, followed by d3. So, for, for example, on bishop e8, king c2. Uh, he played bishop d3. Okay, I played knight e6, threatening to go knight f4 check. Uh, and on knight f4 check, he would probably have to take. Uh, and then again, we're in an equal endgame. So, he played bishop f5. I repeated, I went back to c5 and g5. And now I played king c4 and I'm threatening d3. Uh, of course, there's no way I can be better, but uh, d3 is an annoying threat to face. Uh, I, I'm not sure he should allow that. So for example, if he plays h5, then d3. Maybe I could win this maybe especially if he goes king d2 uh, so he probably should go uh, king to e3 and now king to c3 and i i don't know honestly i don't know who's uh who's better here if anybody so on king c4 he just played bishop a3 preventing d3 of course if d3 then my bishop hangs in the end 
So here uh, I played bishop f4 and offered the draw because this is now a dead draw. Uh, he cannot go back to the c1 diagonal, c1 h6 diagonal, which means that he cannot make any progress with his pawns and I'm still threatening d3. And if he takes my knight at any point, then again, we're in an opposite colored bishop endgame where I've already successfully blockaded his pawns, which means that there is no way he could, he could advance. So he accepted the draw. And I was probably very close to losing before he'd played uh, queen f3. So coming back uh, to the position before queen f3, he should have just continued with a simple developing move like bishop e3. And he probably would have beaten me. But as it turns out, I managed to survive an endgame against a bishop pair, uh, against a grandmaster. So this is the first time I didn't lose to a grandmaster, actually. Uh, I did draw grandmaster Misha Cebalo uh, once, but he was much lower rated than GM level at the time. So yeah, I was really happy with the result. And... I was ecstat ecstatic actually. I should also mention that I m met a ton of great people who came to me to meet me during the tournament. I also have to apologize to those uh, who came to meet me and I was upset or antisocial after I have a bad game. Not this day, but in the future rounds, I just cannot talk. So I'm sorry if that happened to you. I hope uh, I wasn't too rude or I hope I didn't seem rude, I didn't mean to be. Okay, thank you very much for watching. Hope you got something from the game. Stay tuned for more chess. Bye-bye.